There's been a lot of talk in the brewing world about thiols, aromatic compounds that invoke intense citrus and tropical fruit notes. The problem lies in getting those thiols into beer. So this being Brewlosophy, I'm undertaking an experiment. I'm brewing two cold IPAs side by side, same recipe for both, each using thialized yeast. And in one batch, I'm going to do everything I can to free up bound thiols. The other batch, those bound thiols will need to free themselves. Then I'm going to present the two beers to 20 participants in a blind triangle taste test to see if they can spot a difference between the two brews. You didn't make them all the same, did you? Oh, and I'll be taking these triangle tests myself, and I really, really want to nail this. This is the Brilosophy Show. So we've got two brewing systems here so I can brew them side by side. Can you guess which one I've used the most? Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's get the green in the first one. I'm gonna start off with just the regular cold IPA. Now the malt bill of a cold IPA is pretty interesting when you compare it to what a sort of a regular IPA would be. Now a typical IPA will try to combine a malt backbone with hops and you get that nice combination. That's what I really enjoy about the style. But a cold IPA is all about creating a very dry, basic malt backbone and really bringing the hops to the fore. So 39% of this recipe is Great Western Superior Pilsen Malt. Another 39% is Great Western Northwestern Pale Ale Malt. And the remaining 22% is flaked corn. So you're not gonna get much sort of biscuit or cracker in a malt base like that. In terms of mash temperature, quite cool. This one is gonna be mashed at 146 Fahrenheit, so that's 63 Celsius. So to recap, the purpose of this experiment is to evaluate the differences between a cold IPA made using standard methods and one that was brewed using three methods to release bound thiols. And those methods are mash hopping, using phantasm thiol powder, and reducing the dry hop while fermenting with bioengineered yeast. By the way, if you're wondering how I'm running two 240 volt systems with only one plug in my brewery, well, I've had to get a bit creative that's hooked up to my dryer plug upstairs and it happens to be exactly above my basement brewery, just two stories down. So it's got a really long cable and uh, I run it into the brewery here. Now, while many hop varieties have been identified as possessing free thiols, much of the focus of late has been on bound thiols or precursors that require a specific enzyme called beta lyse to be unbound during fermentation and a bunch of labs have released yeasts that have been bioengineered to possess the specific gene that accomplishes this unlocking function. And those yeasts are typically known as thylized yeasts. But yeast alone may not be enough. Hops and barley have a lower concentration of thiol precursors than say grapes, which is where thiol powder like Phantasm can help. A powder made from New Zealand's Sauvignon Blanc grape skins that can be added to beer. There's also some evidence that mash hopping can assist in the release of bound files from barley malt. For beer number two, it's exactly the same malt. This is the same grain bill. This is so far so similar, but here is where I'm gonna introduce the first part of the variable, which is to add in mash hops. So I have 28 grams of SARS hops, and I'm gonna actually incorporate these, just sprinkle them into the mash. Now, one aspect of that is I'm now adding a little bit of bitterness to my mash, which will result in the IBU being a bit higher, but not much. About three or four points of IBU bitterness this will add, and I'm going to take care of that, adjust that, uh, when we add in the remaining bittering hops into both of these. Now, this cold IPA recipe was provided to me by Great Fermentations, where it's sold as Glacial Advance, and I asked Jeremy from Great Fermentations about how this beer recipe came to be. So Glacier Advance, the cold IPA that you got, we've made probably 30 gallons of it in-house. I have a group of home brewers who I'll send, like, much like you, I'll send a kit to. We just let them brew it. And then, you know, for this one, we had them all come in and, and everybody tasted it. And they were like, oh, I like this one. I like this one. I don't like this one. Cause they all had a little bit of different variations. We settled and ran on the one that everybody kind of agreed was the best. Now, the thylized version 
you're my guy on that one. We haven't brewed that one yet. Now, both beers will receive a single hop addition during the boil. It's a 60 minute boil. So this will be going in at the start of 60 minutes as the bittering hop addition. What is it? It's Idaho 7. This is a pretty high alpha acid, reasonably high anyway, 12%. And I'm gonna get about 50 IBU of bitterness from this. So this goes into both of these batches. I have pretty much two of everything so I can do this brew, but I only have one of these hoods. So uh, this is a bit of a challenge trying to get the steam up there. Man, this is a lot of stuff on my brewing table. Okay, so the boil for the first beer, the regular cold IPA is complete, the one hour boil. I'm going to add most of my hops now in a hop stand. And to do that, I need to chill this works to 170 Fahrenheit. So I'm doing that now. I'm just using my plate chiller to cool it down. So the hops I'm using for the hop stand, I have Citra Cryo. This is super high alpha acid, 25.3. But I'm primarily using this for its aroma properties. And then I have two packets of Strata. So there's two ounces of Strata. Add them in. I don't really have any whirlpool capabilities in this kettle, but a trick the claw hammer guys taught me was to recirculate kind of at half speed through the hot filter. That way I can perform something of a whirlpool. For the thialized beer, it's much the same, but not quite. So I'm going to be using Citra, Cryo Hop Citra again. But this time only one packet of strata, so half the dosage. That's just, this is to kind of address the, the IBU difference because we want the beer to really come out with the same IBU at the end. And then once those are added in, it's the main event, the Phantasm Thial Powder. So this is another chance to unlock some of those thial precursors. And this is 2.5 ounces, which is what is recommended for a five gallon batch. Both beers have come in at 1066 and it's time to add the thialized yeast. It's a lager yeast, same one in both of course. This is Luna Crush Lager and its job is to bio-transform those thial precursors. So I'm going to add one into each and yes it's a cold IPA and yes it's a lager yeast but I'm gonna ferment warm, 65 Fahrenheit, 18 Celsius. Now there's one more variable and that's dry hopping. While I'd originally intended to make the same dry hop addition to both batches, I was gonna add Citra and Simcoe, a great fermentation is recommended I do not add the Citra to the thialized batch since high dry hopping rates can suppress thials. If we're trying to get a bunch of thials out, what are some of the things that can like reduce them? Well, doing a big dry hop in your beer can reduce it. Don't want to spend all the time making the uh, unleashing the thials just to throw them back down at the bottom of the fermenter, so to speak. I cold crashed, burst carbonated, and moved into kegs, ready for the triangle test. And just before we get to that, a quick reminder to consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy. By committing a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished recipes, unique discounts at Yakima Valley Hops, and an invitation to a live Q and A session. Hey, I was on one of those. Okay, now a quick primer on how this triangle test works. I presented participants with three opaque cups. In the blue cup was the beer made using standard methods. The bound thial friendly beer samples were added to the red and green cups. Participants were blinded, so they knew nothing about the variable or even the style of beer they were tasting. Well, the first one I was quite shocked about how much it just smells in general and they're encouraged to sniff and taste the beers and then tell me, which is the odd one out? The, the green is the odd man out. At least that's, that's what I'm coming up with. Okay, well, I'll still go with blue. Still going with red is different. I could be totally wrong. And if I am, you've totally fooled me. So the results, while 11 tasters would have to accurately identify the unique sample in order to reach statistical significance, only 10 did, indicating participants in this study were unable to reliably distinguish a cold IPA made using methods to release bound files from one where the methods were not used. But look, to my mind, there was a difference, a clear difference, both to aroma and taste. Question is, could I prove it by taking five triangle tests myself? I feel like my best chance is gonna be on the smell. Number three is the odd one out and also my preference. 
Let's do this four more times. This one clearly has less aroma. Three is the up one out. All right, I really want to finish with a winning record here. Up and out, number three. Yes! I was pretty happy with my winning record, but Marshall tells me that three out of five is not really a passing grade. And I have to admit, the beers were much closer in both aroma and taste than I initially thought. They're far more similar than they are different. So was, was this worth it? Should I be adding mash hops and thialized powder to my beers brewed with thialized yeast? Ultimately, this came back non-significant, but I think I got pretty close to something here, and I'm all for trying more methods to produce the fruitiest IPA possible.